Is it just me, or does it seem like every car on the road is white, black, or silver? So boring! Factory car colors used to be so cool. Remember the shades of Dodges and Plymouths from the 70s? The wild colors of Volkswagens and Jeeps in the 90s? So what happened? Well, in this episode, we're gonna take a look at how the economy influences color options, why certain colors cost more than others, and why the hell they used to put fish in paint. As paint technology advances, and we have access to more and more colors and types of paint, why are car colors so boring now? This is coming from a guy who drives a black car, by the way. Hi, Nolan here. Ever since I decided to simplify my life, my stress level has gone down and I'm carving out more time for self-care. Look, this is everything I own. The Ridge wallet fits in so well with my lifestyle because look, it's sleek, low profile, and instead of schlepping around a bunch of stuff I don't need, I can easily carry a few cards, my ID, and some cash. The Ridge wallet is basically two metal plates bound by a durable elastic band. It comes in titanium, carbon fiber, and aluminum. So there's a Ridge wallet for everyone. Perfect for my newfound minimalist lifestyle. Thank you, Ridge wallet, for sponsoring Wheelhouse. Can I borrow someone's uh, toothbrush? Thanks. We have access to more colors now than ever before, but despite that, people still choose dull colors for their cars. But it wasn't always like that. Around the beginning of the 20th century, car paint was directly influenced by elaborately painted horse carriages. The oil-based paint jobs were expensive and took weeks to dry. The worst part is that the paint faded and turned yellow after a short time, so they had to be repainted at a premium. Henry Ford recognized this problem and worked to develop a different type of paint that didn't suffer this yellow fading. Instead of oil-based, this new paint Ford developed was asphalt-based. It was superior for a number of reasons. Asphalt is dark and the dark colors lasted longer, the drying time was shorter, and the painting process fit into his assembly line perfectly. One thing I learned about Ford's painting process is that they were so finicky about hair and dust messing up the paint job, the painters had to do their job naked. <laughs> I'll tell you one guy you wouldn't want to paint your car naked because you're worried about his body hair. Me. I would show you, but then we'd get demonetized. When the 1920s rolled around, colors became more eclectic and extravagant. We started seeing some cars being painted in up to four different colors. A new innovation by DuPont at the time further advanced the automotive paint game. Their compound, called pyroxylin, made paint on cars more durable and able to drive within minutes instead of hours, saving time and money. Pyroxylin could be found in their Duco line of paints, which featured eccentric colors for the time, like orange, red, and blue. Colors that would normally suffer the effects of yellowing started lasting longer. So now that cars didn't have to be repainted as frequently, these normally higher end color options were more affordable and available to a broader range of car buyers. People loved the new color options, but Henry Ford was resistant, mainly because he had spent so much money developing the asphalt-based paint that was limited to black and other color options like black. He was serious when he said, any customer can have a car painted in any color, so long as it's black. It's a great quote though. So serious that he voided warranties of any Ford car that was repainted in a different color. What a petty asshole. But that didn't stop the flood of brightly colored cars from dominating the market. Advancements in paint technology aside, what happened between the 1910s and the 20s that sparked this color renaissance? Well, the whole world went to war, that's one thing. During World War I, a lot of car manufacturers used their resources to support the war efforts. So not only did they have to tighten their belts when it came to relatively superfluous things like paint, but also people buying cars didn't really wanna show off with fancy colors during this somber time. That makes sense. This consumer shift back to more basic dull colors would periodically pop up again and again throughout the century during times of strife. Which goes to show, the popularity of car colors directly mimics what was going on at the time. While the 1920s were full of vibrant colors, the stock market crash of 1929 brought upon a return back to those toned down colors like grays and dark greens. Things briefly became more colorful after the crash, and we started seeing different paint innovations during this time, including metallic paint. This type of paint was reserved served only for the extremely rich because the metallic glint was made possible by the addition 
of fish scales. Get this, it took 40,000 herring to make one kilo of paint. Some might say that's excessive, but those people haven't seen the art deco curves of a 1930s fender accentuated by the scales of 40,000 herring. Actually, now that I'm saying it, it does sound kind of wasteful. But rest easy, PETA. Makers of this metallic paint eventually swapped the herring for aluminum flakes, which they should have just done in the first place. That sounds way more logical. The colors of the 1930s were short-lived, and with the start of World War II, colors quickly reverted back to being drab. But as soon as Dub Dub 2 ended, that's when we see the bright and flashy colors of 1950s cars. The red Corvettes, teal Chryslers, and iconic pink Cadillacs. And don't forget all that chrome trim. Chrome's coming back. This was a time of prosperity and people wanted to show off. The rainbow of colors continued through the 60s and early 70s until a one-two punch of the Vietnam War and the gas crisis Kind of put a damper on things. Earthy colors like tan, beige, and brown quickly overtook the flashier colors. The public was in crisis mode, and a shift to more muted tones was in response to the psychedelic colors of the 1960s. Peace, love, and optimism was overshadowed by a rising death toll overseas. One group of cars that maintained the bright colors, though, was muscle cars. Dodge, in particular, had some of the craziest of them all. Names like Top Banana, Go Mango, and my personal favorite, Plum Crazy. I'm gonna have a Plum Crazy car one day. It's gonna happen. That's called freaking realization. Towards the mid to late 80s, things started getting flashier again though, a trend that would continue into the 90s. The economy was doing pretty good in the 1990s, and that's when we started seeing the yellow and teal Jeeps, bright green Dell Souls, purple Geo Metros, fire red Pontiacs, the list goes on and on. Even the shades of white were cooler. So what happened? Where did all the colors go? Did something like the recession of 2009 affect the popularity of certain car colors? Sounds logical, and in many ways it did. Silver was the most popular car color 10 years in a row around the turn of the century until it was dethroned by white. In the US alone, the colors white, black, silver, and gray make up a whopping 77% of all car colors, according to German firm BASF, who makes paint. It's pretty freaking boring if you ask me, but it's nice to know that this is backed up by data and not just me going crazy counting white cars on the freeway. It's what I do every night before I go to bed. And it's not just in the US. The whole world is wild for boring car colors. In fact, 39% of cars worldwide are painted white. What is it about these colors that makes 77% of drivers choose them? Well, as we've seen, car colors follow trends. And right now, white is chic. 20 years ago, silver was the most popular color. We were entering a new millennium and car manufacturers used silver as a way of being clean and futuristic, like spaceships. Some of the most iconic cars that looked just right in silver were the Audi TT, the new Beetle, even the Plymouth Prowler. These futuristic designs set the trend and soon everybody wanted a spaceship car. But at some point, a little known startup by the name of Apple started coming out with white products. People saw the brand as clean, simple, and high tech. So that was when white started gaining popularity, eventually surpassing silver as the most popular color. But we can't give Apple all the credit. One reason is that colors generally cost more. A base Tesla Model 3 in white starts at $33,690. But if you want red, that's a $2,000 option. Another reason is resale value. It's a commonly accepted theory among car dealers that you'll lose $500 to $700 in resale value just because the color of your car. If you have a black, white, or silver car, that's something you don't really have to worry about. Those colors are always in vogue. And $700 dollars is nothing to scoff at while you're selling a used car, so it's understandable that people take this into account when they pick a boring color. I can't blame them. Another reason people are buying boring cars is that we haven't bounced back from the recession of 2009. People are still being frugal with their money, and one easy thing to skimp on is the color of your car. Even if a red paint option doesn't cost more at the dealership, you're going to be paying more in insurance if you drive a red car. That alone would drive someone like me to get a different colored car. I hate making insurance payments. <laughs> They cost me money. Also, red is a cop magnet and speeding tickets are no joke. Manufacturers have taken notice and started stocking dealerships with mostly white, black, and silver cars. They do this because they know those cars will sell. But it also creates opportunities for their premium cars to be painted in more exotic colors to stand out. The premium luxury car market is one sector that you can still find a plethora of different colors. And that makes sense. If you want attention, one of the best ways to do that is to buy an S5 in Merlin purple. Let's be honest, 
People don't buy high-end performance cars to blend in. They want people to notice their cars. Lambos are yellow, Ferraris, they're red. What's the point of a car like that if it doesn't turn some heads? The only other type of car that's not gonna be affected by what I'm gonna call the drabening are small cars. It's common to see cars like the Fiat 500, Ford Fiesta, or Honda Fit painted in vibrant, eye-catching colors. Maybe it's the car equivalent of a Napoleon complex, or maybe it's a way to attract attention so you don't run these tiny cars off the road. I'm not sure, but they're fun. One thing worth pointing out is that the colors of trucks and SUVs are always gonna be less flashy than sports cars and sedans. And look, I know someone in the comments is gonna type out, uh, uh, no one, comma, Ford Lightning, comma, hold my beer. There are exceptions, of course. One reason is that there's just more surface area on those cars than others. A big honker, like a Ford F-250, is gonna require more paint than a Mustang, and in turn, be more expensive to paint. What are car colors gonna look like in the future? Who's to say? I'm thinking that there is another recession in the next couple of years, which statisticians are saying might happen. White, black, and gray might stay the most popular colors for a long time. So we shall see. One thing I do know, I'm sick of seeing so many boring colored cars on the road. It's not the consumer's fault. It's more deep rooted than that. I hope we start to see car manufacturers take more risks in the future with car colors. Thank you for watching Wheelhouse. Let me know in the comments what your favorite color is. I don't know why I went so high register when I said that. Definitely Plum Crazy is my favorite. Follow Donut Media on Instagram and Twitter at Donut Media. Follow me at Nolan J. Sykes. Hey, if you like this video and you wanna see more, please hit that subscribe button. If you wanna hear more about Henry Ford being a weirdo, check out our podcast, Past Gas the History Podcast. It's a lot of fun. You can find it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your stuff, or you can watch it on our other channel, Donut Podcasts. I'll leave a link for that in the description. Thank you so much for watching. Be kind, I will see you next time.